All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, we'll get right into it here. So um, SEMs or BMPs, depending on where you are in the country, uh, if it's working, it's going to need maintenance. Uh, SEMs and BMPs aren't just something that we use to check the box. They're intended to provide water quality uh, treatment and uh, flow control over the life of the project. These are just a couple of pictures uh, from the field. We have a HDS, uh, a couple of swales, and uh, some energy dissipation rock in one of our Filtera systems. A quick question. Can anybody in the room uh, provide me an example of a BMP or an SEM that's functioned as designed for the last 20 years without maintenance? Or 10 years without maintenance? Or five? 20? Yes, treatment wetland. <laughs> uh, well, I think the, the short answer is none of them work without maintenance. And part of your typical ONM responsibilities uh, that all of your BMPs or SEMs require inspection or maintenance uh, over the course of the uh, life of the, the unit. So worst case scenario, you only get to inspect about 20% of those units um, in a five-year permit cycle. So three questions that you think you should probably ask during the design phase of the project here are, can it be maintained? How much does it cost? And how often must it be maintained? Uh, one of the kind of takeaways here is maintenance is really subjective. Um, shorter maintenance intervals are kind of impractical. Uh, longer maintenance intervals are kind of unmanageable. They kind of just build up over time and it becomes sort of a liability. So that was a, sort of a case for real-time sensors. Um, routine inspections, just kind of going out and kicking the tires, don't really help you plan for a timely BMP maintenance. Um, they don't guarantee water quality outcomes and they don't really help you respond to spills or uh, sudden BMP failure. So other municipal utilities rely on real-time sensors. So, you know, why can't stormwater? And my co-presenter is not here, but this was his, he really thought this was a, a great one. He's got a toaster uh, that talks to his phone. So, you know, this is pretty much, why don't we have uh, real-time sensing in our stormwater BMPs? <laughs> But he really liked that. So I'm glad he's going to be really excited that you guys just laughed at that. <laughs> uh, so the challenge uh, years ago, uh, we, we kind of laid out these kind of challenge for our R&D group and product development group was to develop a really simple system. Uh, we had to come up with some metrics that would indicate maintenance was required. Uh, had a system that had to be versatile that you could use it in all common BMPs. Uh, the data that you were going to output was easily, uh, you could integrate it into asset management systems. It had to use real-time data to, to identify when the, when the system needed to be inspected and or maintained and um, had to provide texts or emails or update a dashboard. Um, and the total cost, this was 20 years ago, had to be under $1,000. And that was just... You know, blue, we never achieved that. Like we just shelved it 10 times. Uh, we never got to that under thousand dollar market. So uh, like I said, 20 years ago, you can see by the price of gas in the back, <laughs> <laughs> which really uh, was like $1.39. Uh, early on, we did a lot of field monitoring for uh, filtration BMPs up and down the I-5 corridor without telemetry. So basically we drove from Portland to Bellingham three to four times a week uh, in that van, me and my uh, co-presenter here, Jeremiah. Uh, early prototypes of this device, we basically just needed something to tell us when the systems were going into to bypass because uh, extended periods of bypass with normal precipitation signaled filter occlusion and that our systems required maintenance. So uh, like I said before, cost and reliability were 
were huge hurdles. We, we couldn't find uh, telemetry systems for under $1,000 back then uh, to notify us when our systems needed maintenance. And some of the early prototypes were just huge, like size of a suitcase uh, or, and, and weren't, uh, didn't really hold up that well. So we really had to develop a simple approach. And that's where we came up with the overflow detection system. Uh, this doesn't really exist anymore, but this was kind of our concept. This is a storm filter system. Uh, there's a float switch uh, hanging off the wall that's set at the bypass um, so that when the system fills, oh, the next slide will show, uh, the, the system will fill up to the top of the cartridges and hopefully uh, will drain down after, after it's done raining, after the event. So it was really just three simple parts, a bilge float switch and a state logger and a piece of Tupperware. That's kind of what we came up with. It worked really well. Um, the state logger basically, when the switch goes up, uh, it activates uh, sort of a time event uh, and it'll calculate the duration it takes for the switch to reset. So you'll know when the system drains down, how long that takes. So it's just a real simple measurement. We don't have to collect uh, continuous data, it just collects events. So a uh, real small data requirement, uh, data storage capacity requirement for these early loggers that we, we used with Onset. So filter applications, pretty much we had everything we needed, two major design variables that gave us what we need, driving head, which was ponding depths, and drain down time, which was controlled by the media or an orifice. And you can kind of see this uh, shaded in red area. That's the ponding inside the system. After the event, it should drain all the way down. And then the same for a sand filter here. This is a system that didn't drain down uh, and just kind of stay that way for a good month. Uh, same principles for bioretention and biofiltration systems. Uh, max ponding depth should go down after the rain event. And if it's kind of just hanging there, then you know that you should go out and inspect the system or maintain the system. Really simple. So it's just a filtera unit here and a uh, bioswale. In, in, these, in these two systems? I have a picture. Sorry. We're getting there. <laughs> So what if you don't have, um, a, a, there's no ponding depth, uh, you can just use this uh, overflow and use that as your max level and uh, put your switch, mount your switch at the invert of those uh, structures uh, and look for the drain down time from, from there. So like I said, we wanted to be able to use it not just in storm filters, but in um, other practices as well. So the solution, uh, we worked with a number of vendors. This is uh, from the agriculture, precision agriculture um, industry. So these are installed in fields all over the place. Um, they are small telemetry units that uh, have five inputs. They're, they have a five-year battery. They're easy to deploy. Um, they're, they kind of hit the price point after kind of multiple iterations of under a thousand dollars and um, you can hook them up with a solar panel so you never have to replace the batteries and uh, use an external antenna if you have signal signal issues typical uh, smart sensor architecture the sensors uh, go to the, the modules there um, and then broadcast the data up to the cloud where it's stored and then in the cloud is where kind of all the data processing happens where It'll send out notifications via text or email or update a, a dashboard. <laughs> just another package of the internals for this particular unit that we used. Real, real great thing here for, for uh, field staff is that LCD screen. Uh, you don't have to hook this up to a laptop to confirm that the sensors are working or that it's communicating with the cloud. Real simple icons there. You just press the cloud button. It blinks and you know, you know you're connected. If it doesn't blink, you know, if, you, if you're not connected, then you can't uh, leave the site. Um, you've got your 
as SIM cards, the factory can install them, or you can just use your own SIM cards uh, and hook it up to the network. And then that battery, rechargeable battery pack here, the back side of that lid is a solar panel. So uh, when you install them above ground, you can recharge your, your batteries. So kind of ODS 2.0, but it's not really uh, ODS, it's just a float switch. <laughs> uh, this little black thing underneath the switch um, is kind of the special part that we work with Onset uh, to develop. So it's sort of an updated version of that state logger, which they stopped building in 2002. We convinced them to make it again uh, for this particular project. Uh, so you can just hook up your float switch to this uh, smart sensor and then hook it to the RX station. Uh, same thing as the build switch. Uh, the, when it goes up, it activates. And when it resets, we're calculating that time, which gives us drain down time. And this is like the lowest possible power use that we could come up with for a sensor. This, it uses no power. We can deploy these things for multiple years and they can uh, run off one battery and make us make a phone call once a week to upload data or once a month to upload data. Really, we didn't want to spend our time maintaining sensors. We just kind of wanted to install them and collect data for a year or to three years without uh, a lot of upkeep. If you wanted to add more sensors, so with our pilots, we added non-vented pressure sensors uh, to collect data alongside the float switches to verify that we were accurately kind of depicting when the systems were draining down and if it was uh, was working or not. These are really tough uh, sensors. Uh, they don't need, uh, need a lot of maintenance. Uh, they give you temperature, uh, water pressure, parametric pressure, and differential uh, pressure. But the more sensors you add to these stations, the more power uh, you need. So it's kind of a balance of how how long do you want to have them out in the field? How much? What's your power budget um, to basically keep it as simple as possible? Keep your demand, your battery load as low as possible. So we had. We had nine pilot sites over the last three years, four active treatment BMPs in partnership with Permatease, uh, a pond, a dry well, and three BMP test facilities throughout Washington, Oregon, and uh, California. This is one of our um, underground installations. So you can see the stealing well kind of connected to the access ladder. And then we just used the avocado float because it was a great debris shedding option for uh, for our float switch. Um, you can install these stations above ground or below ground. You can't submerge the stations, we found out real quick. <laughs> so no matter what rating you have or what you do, what kind of seals you apply to the gaskets, they all get a little bit of water in and electronics and water just don't mix that well. Um, we also found that you can't install them under manhole covers, uh, the signal, Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. We haven't figured out exactly why it works and sometimes and why it doesn't. We do know that you need uh, an external antenna. So this is one of our pond setups where we actually put a rain gauge. We hooked a rain gauge up uh, to the sensor and then uh, a stilling well in the pond. These little uh, recessed antennas you can put in the manhole uh, and then run that down to your sensor so that you can get connectivity underground. Uh, I really push for above ground with a solar panel so that you don't have to get into a confined space to maintain the sensors. Uh, I like the above ground option, but you can do it underground if you need to. Uh, this is just a quick uh, look at our uh, interface. So all of the stations kind of have this GUI or graphic user interface or you have pins. Uh, that identify the station and then the associated um, metadata. This is down in our Oceanside facility in California. Um, and just sort of a, every station has a GPS trip uh, chip. So when you first start it up, you basically locate it and then it self-populates. And you can push this data out to uh, the raw data to, to help integrate it into asset management, existing asset management software. Um, so this is just kind of the size of these float switches. They're really small, 
stainless steel. Um, this is at one of our labs where we were just doing some trials. Uh, the outputs here were just sort of a traffic light. Uh, you know, it's working properly. It's, it's There's an error, there's a battery error. Uh, did it check in, did it not check in? So this is just kind of our beta uh, dashboard here. The boxes are kind of about the size of a tissue box, maybe a half the size of that. Um, really small, uh, really simple. And this is one of the, the outputs from our station. So you have this stair step, that's the drain down times, and then below the, the water level um, in the month of February. So it looked like we had, uh, for the sites that we monitored, none of them actually uh, required maintenance. So we probably need to start looking at heavier loading or maybe a different land use. Um, this was in Bellingham. So I guess they do a really good job at maintaining their systems. So we thought we would get uh, a little bit more loading. Um, really didn't have too many issues. Really clean runoff it was, it was uh, the wrong site for us. <laughs> no offense, going in. Um, so the alarms are sort of my favorite thing here. You collect all this data, it goes up to the cloud, and then you can kind of set these triggers. And uh, our simple trigger here was, does it drain down within 12 hours? And if it didn't, then it's going to text or email um, stakeholders that the system maintenance is recommended. So you know, uh, you'll kind of get these alerts over time. To, to know that you need to prioritize your, your inspection or maintenance of that system in your, in your inventory. It also alerts you for battery voltage uh, or connectivity issues. Like if it hasn't connected, if someone vandalized it or, or took it or if something happened to the station. So large scale, uh, you know, what we think is that this is really gonna help optimize inspections uh, in Portland. We have like over 2000 green streets. Um, they're not all being inspected. Uh, so this is something that we think that cities uh, on a large scale could use to optimize their O&M uh, activities. Uh, that the data could be pulled into asset management systems like we, we kind of said before. And that there's applications for um, regional control measures, TMDL, uh, TMDL outfalls, and industrial sites for uh, discharge. Uh, we actually use them at some of our facilities to, to track if we're discharging or uh, if we need to take samples. So next steps, uh, this is kind of a work in progress. We've got a couple of prototypes out there. So uh, we're looking at uh, different dashboards, um, different uh, data push options to push it to other third party software and uh, pulling in local data so that we, local weather data so that we don't have to collect uh, rainfall data, which is just one last thing that, you know, we're responsible for. You can just pull in the local rainfall data and pair that up with your drain down times. Uh, hardware, we're looking at uh, infiltration sensors, trash capacity sensors, and sediment deposition for other products like uh, HDS, and uh, trash separation units. Um, the real goal here has always been to just keep the cost down. So uh, we we kind of set the target of like under a thousand dollars. It's it just keeps going down. It's you know the cost of these units. Uh, the technology is really simple. Uh, it's it's going down uh, probably half of that now for 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 these units. If you're trying to develop something um, and, and really just one to two sensors and a real simple telemetry uh, system. So that's all I have for now. Any, any questions?